John Stockwell was a high CIA official for 12 years. He quit at that time and wrote the book In Search of Enemies. There was also a documentary made about John and his experiences in the CIA and his life. This documentary has been seen over a lot of the world in film festivals, Sweden, in the United States, and in Germany, but never on any of the TV networks, including public television. John, you're a no-no. <laughs> well, we'll find out why, and John will be able to speak free and uninhibitedly tonight, as everybody always does, on Alternative Views News Magazine. Good evening. Welcome to Alternative Views. Tonight we have a very special program for you featuring John Stockwell. John was a former CIA officer who wrote a book exposing the CIA operations in Angola called In Search of Enemies. Last year we had John on for a two-hour special portrait discussion in which we discussed how he got into the CIA, what disillusioned him about CIA operations, and had one of the first television discussions of the activities of the CIA, their recruitment, their day-by-day -day operation, and the problems that, they, that the CIA causes for American foreign policy and the subversion of American values that are their daily practice. Tonight, we're going to have a follow-up to this. We will begin with a documentary film on the life of John Stockwell that was made by Sal Landau and Haskell Wexler. This excellent documentary was shown in many foreign film festivals. It won a lot of prizes, but needless to say, it has never been shown on American television. So we'll have the, the TV debut tonight of the documentary by John Stockwell, about John Stockwell. We will also have a special news feature in which we will show you how the network television news covered the story about the Russian troops that were supposedly discovered in Cuba and the manufactured crisis and the political uproar that this caused. We will have John's reaction to the network covering of this story, and we'll have an account that goes behind the scenes that tells you how this story was actually manufactured. We will also have a special one-hour discussion with John that will discuss his current views on the CIA, particularly why he thinks the CIA should be abolished and why it is a counterproductive agency that is really subversive of our democracy and the primary American values that we believe in. We'll begin, John, with having a discussion with you about the documentary that was made. Could you tell us a little bit about how this film was made and what your reaction to it is before we actually look at it? Yes, I think it's an interesting uh, story, the way uh, Saul Landau and Haskell Wexler put it together. They came. Uh, down to uh, to Austin to do the filming, part of it done on up on Lake Travis and part of it around town here. I think it covers a, uh, various aspects of uh, of sort of how John Stockwell got to be with my my childhood in Africa and Marine Corps experience and whatnot. It, it, its statements about the CIA are are pretty good. I did have one reservation about it when it was all over, though, that I think is uh, I appreciate having the opportunity to, to say before you see the film. And that's that uh, Saul Landau uh, checked me out, so to speak, looked me over, and decided that, as, as he put it, he's a political activist, that I would be more effective, uh, as he put it, if I were presented as an ex-Marine officer who would have been happy with the CIA if it had been efficient. 
And uh, that's, that's not why I gave up my career and, and uh, quit the CIA and, and committed the, the career suicide, economic suicide that I did. I think it's certainly an argument against the CIA that it's incredibly inefficient and ineffective, but that comes after uh, several other issues like the morality of an organization that has committed uh, acts of terrorism around the world, killing hundreds of thousands of people and discrediting the United States and making the world a much less safe place for, for us to live and do business in. John, what about distribution and showing of the film? It's been shown overseas, it's been shown in film festivals, but the networks, including PBS, won't touch it. What's the background on that? Well, that pretty much says it right there. It was shown at the New York Film Festival and provoked uh, the biggest discussion of any film that was shown there. It was shown at a German film festival and, and likewise was uh, not controversial. It provoked a, a great discussion about the CIA on Swedish national television, German national television, uh, throughout Europe and various parts of the third world. Uh, the U.S. networks, of course, uh, the biggies, won't show any film they haven't done themselves. And so they wouldn't consider it. And uh, PBS uh, looked at it, uh, various PBS uh, stations looked at it, and uh, none of them were willing to show it for their own reasons. I don't think it's that controversial. It, uh, I've gone much further in my lecturing and the comments that, that we make uh, on this panel. It, I do not in that film call for a closure of the CIA, uh, which, which in fact I do believe uh, as a patriotic American that the CIA should be closed down. Well, we're going to see the movie now, right? Yeah, let's see the Great movie instead. first. Okay. So this you should... Yeah, I was proud. I mean, my dad works for the CIA, you know. I don't uh, pretend to think that we would have had a very successful marriage, uh, even if we had not been in the CIA. He could go along with it so far, and then the personal benefits were out. It was strictly a matter of principle. I learned he was a CIA officer this last year. Oh, good. Fine, good. I gotta I got find out some junk that he did, you know. I've been straight all my life in terms of uh, working my way through college, and, and uh, the Gates Rubber Company was a conservative company, a good one, and, and very conservative, straight. The Marine Corps. And then 12 years in the CIA, uh, a team man, uh, an organization man, I think with my own individuality. a plane we saw an equivalent of a wild turkey so he raised his 22 and shot from the cab and dropped the bird in its tracks and then he called to his uh, friend up on top of the load of lumber the first one to it gets it and that was quite a race because it meant a lot to both of them Bob won by maybe a yard and <clears throat> so we shared the bird with the other missionaries things like that in their experience and background that they couldn't get over here. And then his mother could tell you some stories about some of his adventures. 
first time he wanted to go on a, on an antelope hunt. Well, it was a place where they drove quite a ways in the car and then had to walk. And uh, uh, never had any of the missionary children gone. And I said, why, Bob, of course you can't go. He says, now, Mother, you told me that I'd live until God was ready for me to end this life, and I want to go. And uh, we let him go. He killed an antelope, and in the night, here came this great commotion in the yard, and uh, he had sent some Africans in with his antelope. He was under 15 years old. So you went from a clean upbringing into a world of dirty tricks in your mature life. Yeah. But the key thing is that as you get recruited into the CIA, it never occurs to you that if you're, if you're as naive as I was, uh, and I think most of the young men that come into the CIA are, it never occurs to you that you're getting into a world of dirty tricks. You're, the, the come on that they have, the, the, the things they use to sell is that you're finally getting into the elite inner circles of the United States government. All your life you've been going through the amateurs and the prelims and the, the prep schools, in effect, and finally this is it. This is where the people are real pros, the frontline warriors uh, saving the nation from communism. The Phoenix program was created by the CIA, and its purpose was to kill and terrorize. In Vietnam, I was forced to do business with a police chief who was a sadistic uh, mutilator of... Uh, of prisoners. He liked to carve them up and throw the remains in the river. And he was completely paid and propped up by the CIA. His whole career depended on one, controlling that operation so that the CIA needed him, and two, uh, the CIA propping him up and funding him. And uh, he did his uh, knife work in a CIA safe house. He called it the pink house. I reported this to the chief of station, and he said, well, you know, it's a rough world, and sometimes you have to do business with people that really aren't your first choice of uh, kind of people you want to associate with, so don't make a way. And so I went back, you know, what do I do? Resign my post? Yeah, you know, that's obviously, that's your last vote, though. You resign and you're out. Uh, and I wasn't ready to give up my career yet. I terminated the safe house. I told uh, case officers that I don't want to hear about it. If this guy has a compulsion to do this sort of thing anymore, uh, I don't want to hear about it. How does the CIA go about recruiting its future candidates for officers and agents? Mm. Mm. Hmm. Have, have any of y'all been approached here as recruiters come through here and talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, um, they haven't had it in this You know, I've somebody heard. in this room might be sweating right now because he's been told, you know, if they ask you, don't to say anything. I hear that they do use professors to uh, keep eyes out in their classes for um, particular students who might be uh, interested in that sort of work, but I wonder how, were you approached here at the university or were you approached sometime later in your career? At the university, a CI recruiter came through. I went and talked to them. He did not write my name down. And in 64, early 64, I got a letter in the mail saying, would I mind if the CI did a security check? Uh, and I wrote back saying, I was restless, and I wrote back saying I'd be delighted if it was uh, uh, for possible employment. With my background, there were fields where I would be unique. From the Congo, I went to the University of Texas and enrolled in the ROTC program. I graduated in 1959 and took a commission in the Marine Corps. I didn't see my future as a career officer, so when my term was up, I accepted an offer as a junior executive at the Gates Rubber Company and went with my family to Colorado. We were very young and idealistic with three children when the CIA first approached us. We were in the Marine Corps for three years and did not want to go the military route, although there was a very promising career there. When you think about his job being a career or a national security, I think that at the time the emphasis was career. I think that uh, most of what he did was for the next fitness report, so to speak. I think that uh, people generate activity that is unnecessary overseas uh, in order to have some activity on their fitness report, and they really don't get promoted within the CIA unless they have so many recruitments, let's say, in a tour of duty, 
or um, so many operations or ops as they call them. The way the CIA works, you're promoted on the basis of your fitness report, which you get every few months or at the end of every assignment, uh, at least once a year, usually more often. And this evaluates your performance both with a letter grade and also a written narrative. That and the assignments you get will, will develop your career. I said, why don't you just go in there and tell them that this is immoral and this is something you can't do. And he said, well, they don't want, you're not going to get anywhere in your career if you say no to assignments. And by that time, though, he was uh, hooked by the CIA. And the assignments were sexy assignments and interesting assignments. In one post, we put seven bugs in a foreign embassy. It was a quite dramatic and very exciting. And we had officers and support officers and technicians flying all over Africa on this thing, and we got them in. Of the seven bugs that we installed, clean, we never got caught, uh, five of them never came up on the air. They were totally defective. The sixth one uh, would transmit, but you, the, the switch, the activator to shut off the thing when no one was speaking uh, was defective, so it burned out its batteries in the course of about six weeks' time and went off the air and one of them functioned properly. And that one, although it was in an ambassador's office of a country that was very much a target of intelligence uh, activities, that one never produced a single disseminable report. And I felt like I was really making time uh, professionally. I was a very young officer when I met my first president. We had a mutual interest. There were things I could do for him, and uh, there were things he could do for us, at least in terms of making me feel secure in his country. If I was meeting him and he appreciated what I was doing for him, it wasn't likely that he was going to throw me out if I made a mistake or got caught. And uh, it was pretty heady stuff for a very young officer. And uh, it meant that uh, I was getting uh, recognition back at headquarters, obviously. You know, there's young Stockwell who's meeting President X. And we better keep our eye on Stockwell. He looks good. My function at home when agents would come to the home would be to turn on the uh, record player and be sure that uh, the curtains were closed and uh, that there was enough security in my own home that the person wouldn't, uh, you know, be compromised by having come to our home. Um, I didn't really, at that time, I didn't realize uh, that we would be putting these people in danger and that some would be put in jail and that some would be dead. A lot of other things happen in the world that's sort of like somebody pushing a rock off the cliff and the rock hits somebody and uh, and then you know they step back and say I didn't kill him uh, the the rock killed him and uh, this is sort of what happened in Ghana the the agency to my knowledge did not write a paper saying let's overthrow Nkrumah the chief of station there was a very aggressive man and uh, he became aware of the fact that there was the possibility of a coup developing and he knew the players uh, people who in the army who were unhappy and he began to report and to, to ask for encouragement to encourage these men. And as I understand it, he was not given a formal permission to attempt to overthrow Nkrumah. But he was given permission to monitor the developments of any coup. And this gave him an excuse to, to meet these officers often, daily, several times a day, and to give them money, uh, and in effect to give them encouragement. A soft file is a file that doesn't have an official name on it or cryptonym on it and is not registered into the agency's IBM system, the system of 201 numbers, so that it can't be traced if, if you come to the agency demanding to see your file and if they have a soft file on you instead of a 201, you'll never get it. They may have a manila folder in there with, with reams of documents about you and you'll never get access to it. There were times when I said, well, let's just get out of the CIA. You know, Bob, really you're making a decision which is, it's, it's getting to the point where it's going to be the CIA or it's going to be our marriage. And he chose the CIA. What an opportunity. I was being asked to, to watch the ball, the Angolan ball game from the outset, how we got into it, what we, uh, the, all the rationalization and justification as well as the decision-making processes I was to watch this game not from the 50-yard line, but from, from the, the field itself, a, a player coach. I mean, go into Angola and get in the action where the 
where the people are, are groveling in the dust and, and losing their lives, as well as the high policy planning sessions in Washington. And uh, I was delighted to, to have the opportunity to, to sacrifice a year of my life to see just how the U.S. government does this sort of thing. The CIA went into Angola in July of 1975. We started out with $6 million, and eventually the total budget was $31 million. The first effort was arms that were sent from America to Kinshasa in U.S. Air Force C-141 planes. And then from Kinshasa, we hauled the arms into Angola in smaller airplanes. The total was uh, about 1,500 tons of arms, 30,000 rifles and small rockets and mortars. Our funds and arms were going to two of the three Angola factions. One of them hit it up by Holden Roberto, who had had a relationship with us for about 15 years, and to Savimbi, who had not been well known by the CIA. He had the sole virtue of being in opposition to the MPLA, whom we were determined to oppose. President Mobutu of Zaire wanted this program. We bribed him. We gave him $2,750,000. CIA officers went in as advisors and trainers. They were called intelligence gatherers. But in fact, uh, they were preparing our allies for combat. I fled to San Salvador on January 16th. What did the enemy do in San Salvador? You mean what I saw? The Americans were there. How do you know they were Americans? When the villagers saw them with their own eyes, they saw they were Americans. There were 20 Americans. These Americans, what did they look like? Were they white? Were they black? Describe them. They were your color, comrade. They were not black. They had chestnut eyes. You know, white. There were not enough CIA advisors to make a great deal of difference, however, and we hired European mercenaries, and we tried to hire white Angolan refugees to go back in as mercenaries fighting on our side. The CIA collaborated with the South Africans, and it was not officially ordered by the National Security Council, but there was liaison at all levels. The CIA was nervous about the role the Senate might play in this war. Senator Clark on the Foreign Relations Committee made a trip to Africa to review the situation, a fact-finding trip to report to the Senate. The CIA watched him with some apprehension to see that he didn't get information we didn't want him to have. The Senate, led by Senator Clark, shut down the Angola program in December of 75. While the Senate was shutting us down, the uh, Cuban army eventually of 10 to 15,000 combat soldiers, MiG-21 aircraft, tanks, uh, just swept over the FNLA and UNITA. And we lost decisively. A victory that will change the course of African history. The victory of the heroic people of Angola. Nevertheless, I think we could have uh, won the thing if we had gone in very quickly. When I went out there and came back, I recommended that, I said the forces are about equal right now. And if we go in with immediate, abundant support, we can win. We can take Luanda. By that, I meant tactical air and, and American advisors put in uh, several hundred troops very quickly and put in some of these really monstrous weapons, uh, airplanes, you know, that fly around shooting 8,000 rounds a minute down, and you'd have been in Luanda just like that. It appears, from what you said, that you advocated that the United States should go into Angola with large weapons, lots of firepower, a small detachment of Americans, and that your plan was rejected, and that was the final straw that did it for you. No, that's very definitely... Uh a misunderstanding. Uh, yesterday we got distracted. 
we were into that and then we didn't get a chance to pursue it, uh, probably changing of cameras or something. Uh, I was sick at my stomach that we were going into Angola. I was, dis I was depressed that the agency would be letting itself get dragged into another paramilitary adventure uh, that quickly after Vietnam, when it would obviously not succeed, we couldn't possibly stay with it. The Senate, the press, and the public wouldn't be about to let us escalate something up to the level that it would have a chance of winning. And uh, it would be highly damaging to the nation and to the, the CIA particularly to, to let ourselves get dragged into some such a thing. Once, and at the outset, when they offered me this job, then I had a choice of, uh, you know, what do I do? Do I participate or do I resign or do I quietly lobby for uh, 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 you know, some other job and let someone else run the Angola program? And my decision was that I was going to stay with the program because it was too interesting to see how does the United States get dragged into these things and how does the CIA conduct them once it's in them. I don't think anybody could, could turn down that kind of an opportunity just to know that it's not what some uh, newspaperman is telling you what happens when he doesn't really know himself. It's what's really happening. You were there running it. So I decided to participate. And in order to make sure that I remained on the inside, I remained a good, good soldier throughout the whole thing. I did not uh, balk or fight it until we got into phases that I thought were just uh, beyond the pale, such as alliances with the South Africans and mercenaries, for example. When I went to Angola, I was sent out there to come back with a military assessment. And uh, that's what I recommended when I got back. If you guys want to win, we can do it. A dramatic weapon, uh, a horrendous weapon, if you will, uh, against the MPLA at that time would have just brushed them aside. It would have decimated them. It would have uh, wiped them out and uh, the FNLA would have been into Rwanda in a few moments' time. Well, suppose they had taken your military recommendation. How would you have felt? I would have uh, stayed as task force chief and participated. I, uh, if, if you're going to do something, you know, if you're going to learn French or a foreign language, the least you can do with your poor pronunciation is uh, speak out. And I think it's, uh, there are certain things that are criminal uh, but you compound it by losing. If you're going to go into Angola, if you have some national compulsion to go into Angola, at least the United States position would be much stronger if you won. And uh, if they had uh, accepted my recommendation at that point, I would have been uh, much happier uh, if, if they had gone ahead and won than I was with uh, the contemptible middle ground that they followed. The overall life overseas is very agreeable. I think it's one of the things that a lot of men in the CIA want to, they want to stay out overseas. It's uh, kind of a colonialist existence. There are lots of servants and uh, the life is very easy. The housing is very adequate, if not plush. We had about six white kids in our class and then um, yeah, everybody just blended in. It was, you know, a little bit of, um, like, racism or whatever on the teacher's part in that, you know, she thought that the black kids were a little deprived and everything. But, you no, know, in the schools, everybody got along. It was a pleasant place for kids to grow up. I mean that you're living with the elite of that society in terms of education basically and experiences the people who've traveled the people who who who've, uh, been involved in a lot of experiences in life you know ambassadors and the people who are running the country and uh, the diplomats in different embassies and uh, so they're sharp people they're intelligent people and they're they're well bred generally so the, the conduct is uh, relatively high a sense of culture when we were in Africa I don't remember everything but I didn't, I don't remember so much about the schools. <laughs> I mean, like, when we were there, we, we'd go on our safaris, and we'd climb Kenya and ran all over the place, and we were just ambitious, doing everything. He was a little older and longer-legged, so he could go on hunting safaris. Mel was just uh, a year, about a year too young. He just couldn't quite uh, pull it off, although he did a lot of the jogging with us.
That's cheating. He's supposed to give us a little bit to get <laughs> to get pumped up. This is about 90 pounds. It's a highly competitive business, and you're working under stress. You go to the same cocktail parties that the State Department officers go to, and then a dinner party after the cocktail party, but in between you go meet an agent, and you pay him off, and you get a receipt, and uh, you rush up to the embassy and stow the stuff so it won't fall out of your pocket at the dinner party or something, and then you go to the dinner party, and then after the dinner party, you go run another errand, and this goes on day in and day out, Saturdays, Sundays, holidays. And when you begin to see that the, the organization as a whole is very sloppy and poorly run and the standards are very low, you're, it's hard to stay motivated. It's hard to keep thinking it's worthwhile. And you really get to a state where you just, just really don't want to have to lock everything about your professional life in a safe and lie to all of the people you know about who you really are and what you're really doing and what your real dreams and aspirations and promotions are and be able to complain to them about your failures or, or, or our problems. Well, I realize now that the business of the CIA is to go out and to corrupt individuals in, their, in place in their own countries and uh, that this is something that corrupts oneself. This was going against his upbringing, which was a strong Christian, very moral background. And he was coming into conflict with himself, hating himself, angry with himself. You know, I would like to, to present myself as a man of intense principle who saw bad things and immediately resigned and, and discussed, but my career was obviously going quite well. Uh, I had the prestige of people coming to me for jobs, coming to me for advice, inviting me to lunch, wanting to play tennis with me. Uh, this is, you know, obviously a human satisfaction. I was not yet uh, in top management. I couldn't really give away a lot of jobs, but I could speak on the behalf of someone. My income was about $33,000 a year. In 10 years, I could retire on a $21,000 a year pension for the rest of my life. I had total security. Was it the thought that you would be continuing to do things like the Vietnam involvement in Angola, and the Angolan involvement that you thought was uh, immoral or counterproductive at the least? Well, what I tried to do was to psych myself into going back to Africa as a chief of station in some place like Khartoum, for example, which would have been a nice post for my grade, and uh, just not push covert operations very much. If something came along that was just sort of irresistible, some agent that just had to be recruited will let an officer in my station recruit him, but basically just play a lot of tennis and let the paychecks come in. This is uh, traditionally what uh, burned out senior case officers do. And I muddled and, and waffled and vacillated and rationalized for about eight months before I could tear myself away. I, I don't really look at it as uh, taking that much uh, guts to quit. I just sort of didn't have any choice. By November and December, I had intense pains in my abdomen, which were obviously the precursors of uh, a stomach ulcer from the internal conflict of wanting to hang on to this career but not respecting it. I had requested many times that Bob just drop out of the CIA, just get out and start life anew someplace. 
um, he wasn't able to do so when I asked him to, but now he has. He's seen even more since our divorce. And um, yes, I do feel vindicated when a man comes back and says you were right all along. Everything you ever said was right. Everything you ever said about everybody who walked into our house was right. What lessons did you learn from your dad's experience? Well, of course, it brings up values just all over the place. And that, <laughs> that I mean, I could go, you could break up on that a whole lot. But, you know, and listening to him right now, I'm learning, <laughs> this is something else. So what's your reaction to CIA now, Mel? I think up high, they're slobs. And then, you know, down in the lower, when you get down into the um, people who are actually out in the field, then they would do the working, you know. It strikes me as, you know, very inefficient, crooked, really just sloppy organization. I was not a, a man at peace with himself. And since I resigned, I do not feel in a position of conflict. I feel in a position of being at peace with myself morally. For our news coverage tonight, we're going to show you some clippings taken from the network television news of the, quote, discovery of the Russian troops in Cuba, and we will show you the way that the television network news handled, covered, and interpreted this event and the political ramifications and how they were covered. Then we will discuss with John if, indeed, the full story was told on network news of the Cuban-Russian relationship. And we will also see what distortions there were in the television coverage. And we'll let John comment and give another interpretation of the political implications of this uh, so-called event. Cuba is obstructing the Senate's work on SALT, the budget, and military planning. As a result, the administration is negotiating with both the USSR and the U.S. Senate. According to congressional sources, both negotiations are serious. With Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin, and with Senate leaders, serious and intricate. Politics on Cuba are more murky in the Senate than in the Kremlin. The administration must strike one deal with the Soviet Union, but many deals here. With Sam Nunn demanding a 5% increase in U.S. military spending before he will vote for SALT II. But Cuba has frozen SALT II. The administration must negotiate with Frank Church, who says no SALT until all the Soviet combat troops leave Cuba. Carter can make no deal with the Soviet Union about the troops without dealing with powerful Scoop Jackson, who wants troops and jets and submarines out before he'll consider SALT. And he won't even do that without a 5% military budget increase. That brings Carter into entirely new negotiations with budget chairman Muskie, who opposes any major spending increase. And according to the White House press secretary, decisions were made about how to deal with the problem posed by those Soviet combat forces in Cuba. There was no further public comment on the nature of those decisions. However, here is a report from our White House correspondent, Sam Donaldson. President Carter may decide to counter the Soviet combat presence in Cuba by stepping up an American military presence, both in the Caribbean and elsewhere in the world. Unless, of course, the Soviets take steps on their own to change the status quo as the president has demanded. No one here will confirm that such a decision is in the works, but the president's own words on this subject 10 days ago point to such an approach. We do have the right to insist that the Soviet Union respect our interests and our concerns if the Soviet Union expects us to respect their sensibilities and their concerns. Otherwise, 
relations between our two countries will inevitably be adversely affected. What the president was clearly saying was that if the Russians don't change the status quo by taking action themselves, the United States will change it through its own actions. Not by provoking a warlike confrontation, but perhaps by stepping up U.S. combat forces in the Caribbean, which would serve to neutralize any possible threat from Cuba, and perhaps by challenging Soviet interest elsewhere through a mix of military and economic moves that, while not directly threatening Moscow, would adversely affect Russian concerns. The president said one advisor is not going to paper over those troops. The status quo will be changed. Sam Donaldson, ABC News, the White House. This is John Scalley. Top administration officials have now started to consider a wide range of military and economic pressures against the Soviets. Among the most sensitive is the possibility of helping arm China with modern weapons, a step that would be sure to alarm the Kremlin. Any such move would come later after other less dangerous decisions, such as sharply reducing American grain shipments now at a record level. It is estimated that American wheat and feedstock exports to the Soviets will surpass $2 billion this year. Administration leaders would be most reluctant to order such cutbacks because of the humanitarian aspect involved in such sales. But if necessary, such decisions would be made, say informants, along with a sharp reduction in shipments of American machinery and high technology items. Military countermeasures would seek to avoid any direct military threat to the Soviets. But steps that would be considered are reinforcing American ground and United States units overseas, plus helping anti-Soviet forces near the Russian border. Carter was told today that unless those Soviet troops are removed from Cuba, there's virtually no chance for Senate approval of the new strategic arms treaty with Moscow. The grim warning came at a White House meeting with congressional leaders. The president's got a tough problem. I said before, the only thing he can't do with this Russian troop problem is nothing. He's got to do something. This is Jimmy Carter's challenge. I, I think we've used too much time. I think the matter should have been dealt with by now. Well, John, you, you were telling me about the situation. Uh, I don't know whether it was you were in Cuba or a friend was in Cuba when the word came down the, oh, to cover it. Yeah, a friend of, a friend of mine, an acquaintance of mine that I met since I got out of the CIA was passing through town, and he had been there covering the Non-Aligned Nations Conference. He was a writer or a he, reporter? He is a writer, yes, mm -hmm. working on a magazine in, uh, in Washington, a controversial magazine, but he was there as a reporter mm -hmm. with the reporters covering the conference. They got, the, the, the various reporters got instructions from their offices in Washington and New York to find out about the Soviets in Cuba. And they sent back uh, messages, according to him, uh, all of them saying, you've got to be kidding. This has got to be some kind of a grand put on. And uh, they got terse messages back from their headquarters saying, it's, it's the big story of right now. Do it. Find out about the, the Soviets in Cuba. And they couldn't believe it. It was, it was an international joke, literally. Now, well, let's back up a big step and note what, what nobody brought out, and they certainly could have, and that's that the, the, the subject, the issue of Soviet troops in Cuba was a spin-off, uh, an evolution of a CIA operation to disrupt and manipulate the Non-Aligned Nations Conference. Uh, Fidel Castro was managing this conference, was hosting it, uh, on, on, in Cuba near America, which, which is uh, a difference, and he's the old anathema to the CIA. The CIA tried to kill him so many times, uh, unsuccessfully, 20 years, unable to rid itself, uh, rid the United States of this communist leader on our shores. And this year, the, the Non-Aligned Nations Conference is meeting in Havana, hosted by Castro. The CIA went all out. The thing they seized on as an issue to discredit Castro was to make him appear to be not non-aligned. He's aligned with the Soviet Union, which is probably true. It's, it's probably his Achilles heel as a non-aligned uh, nation's leader is that he is aligned with the Soviet Union. Uh, how better could the CIA bring this out than to make a big issue of Soviet troops in Cuba? And uh, it's been leaked out. If you read these various articles in Time Magazine and the New York Times and the Washington Post and elsewhere, you notice that uh, it is admitted that the CIA was working with the National Security Council, the National Security Advisor, Brzezinski, on the, the subject of the conference, the upcoming conference. And they did seize on the presence of Soviet troops in Cuba as an issue. And Im exactly during the conference, they make this, this dramatic announcement of Soviet troops 
in, uh, in Cuba. Now, what is brought out in bits and pieces, but not very well, by the media in covering this, by the statements that were quoted, is that th th there was no threatening Soviet presence in Cuba. No one at any point pretended that the U.S. was a uh, national security was being jeopardized by a Soviet force that could invade Florida or Puerto Rico or anywhere else. It was a trivial uh, 2,000 men, approximately. Uh, a lot of semantics were played on whether or not they were combat troops. Uh, well, I would react by saying that they were, in fact, combat troops, but combat troops are also instructors. So the Soviets may be telling the truth there. But uh, they, they, they're infantry troops, but they are not assault troops. Even President Carter, in one of his speeches, admitted this. They didn't have... They, they do not have the delivery capability, the, the ships, airplanes, helicopters, however, to, to move from Cuba to Florida or Puerto Rico or somewhere else. They're not assault troops. They don't have an aggressive posture or capability. They don't have the weapons that would go with a, an assault unit. Uh, the press dramatized this issue by talking, uh, and you, you notice these commentators, the, the drama that they would get in their voices where they would say, Soviet troops in Cuba, you know, and it makes you want to sit up and, and get nervous. If they had said this tiny Soviet force in Cuba every time they brought it up or something like that, it would have put it into its true perspective. Something else? Well, John, do you think they manufactured the story then? that we've known that there have been Soviet troops in Cuba since 1962. Definitely. There were something like 40,000 troops at that time, and most were withdrawn, but there's been two or 3,000 troops there continually. The whole time, and, and Vance's, the Secretary of State's first, the, fr the administration's first announcement of this as being an issue, objected to the status quo. He did not object to the introduction of Soviet troops into Cuba. He said the status quo is unacceptable because he knew that the Soviets knew and the Cubans knew that we knew that they had been there the whole time. There but was nothing new about this issue. The only thing that was new was the Non-Aligned Nations Conference happening. Right, but did the media adequately point out that no new cute Russian troops were actually recently placed in Cuba? Didn't they give the impression from the news clippings that this was something new, something threatening, oh. something dangerous, as if Russia had recently put a whole flock of new troops there that suddenly Certainly. posed a threat. Certainly so this is, this is really distortion of the grossest um, magnitude, magnitude because it's, it's exercising the American people, it's jeopardizing salt. Notice also that every one of the, the senators and, and other individuals that are quoted there has some major vested interest in making an issue out of this except uh, perhaps Senator Byrd. Salt won't go, said Church, unless the troops are out. And presidential hopeful Baker said he won't be able to remain silent if the troops aren't out soon. Now, he either has the guts to do something about it or he doesn't. Uh, there's no need to uh, look at this as though it's a crisis. I was here in the 1962 crisis. I've been here in some pretty tense moments. But there's no crisis here. Uh, Scoop Jackson is the original hawk, always clamoring for more arms and a, a, a more dramatic U.S. military posture. Uh, Baker, of course, and Goldwater, traditionally uh, critics of the Democratic administration, Baker with his own presidential aspirations, both of them conservative, both of them looking for issues that they can stir it up to, to egg the administration on to challenge the Soviets, to sort of go to war. Uh, the Hawks, uh, were able to play this issue into uh, a situation which, which apparently is going to lead, has led, and is going to lead to an escalation of military activity in the Caribbean and greater defense spending. We now have in, in the press uh, today 2,000 more U.S. Marines being put into Guantanamo Bay on Cuban soil and other Marine military uh, maneuvers in the Caribbean. It's been a, it's, it was a field day for the, for the Hawks. Uh, Dunn is another Hawk, 5% military uh, budget increase. Frank Church, of course, is a traditional liberal, but he's in jeopardy of losing his position in the new elections. His uh, state, I believe it's Idaho, has turned uh, conservative under him. And so he was back when this was 
launched, he, he, he was advised of it over a scrambled telephone while he was back in Idaho campaigning. And uh, he, his reaction is, has been quoted abundantly that he said, I can't sit on this. I can't keep this secret. Soviets in Cuba, I've got to come out with it. And the answer from the administration was, we realize that. Meaning, obviously, they called him while he was home, while he was on this ultra-conservative kick, to give him ammun ammunition so he would bring it out and make an issue of it. Carter's uh, objectives are fairly clear. He, at the point that crisis, non-crisis broke, he had never been lower in the polls. His, his political future was, and still is, very much in doubt. And he needed some issue that he could, uh, some crisis, or preferably awful sounding non-crisis, so that he could thump his chest and show how macho he is in handling this non-crisis, and this, so he did. But didn't this backfire in some ways against Carter because, because he wasn't able to effectively do anything about it, that is, he couldn't get the Russians to uh, remove the troops, that it made him look weak again? Well, the, the networks made, uh, this is what surprised me by looking at the uh, coverage of it, the networks constantly made Carter look like a fool. They the president sought counsel from the congressional delegation. To the distinguished Jacob Javits, Mr. Carter said, what would you do? Reply, you mean you called us here at 8.30 in the morning to ask us what we would do? What are you going to do? Senators and congressmen were told the U.S. asked the Soviet Union if the troops were combat troops. Answer from Moscow, no. The U.S. asked if they would take the troops out anyway. Answer, no. Another answer to the same question is expected within a few days. Inquiry, how many days? President, two or three days. Vance, not that fast. Javits, can we have another meeting? Yes, within a week. Vance, not that fast. That is what you call your basic linkage between Cuba and SALT. Even though, sources said, the meeting was told the United States still does not know why the Soviet troops are there. And we do not know exactly how serious it all is. Another congressional leader present accused the president of trying to have it both ways, of being hard on one hand and soft on the other. According to this source, the meeting was not very enlightening or satisfying. Senate Democratic Majority Leader Robert Byrd didn't even bother to attend the meeting with the president. Byrd claimed that he had received a briefing from Secretary Vance last night. The result of today's meeting, the president did win some more time. However, he did not generate much confidence in his leadership. The president hopes this policy will convince hardliners, particularly those in the Senate who are holding the SALT Treaty hostage, that he has effectively neutralized the Russian troops, while at the same time proving anew that he does not panic in a crisis and risk general war. But already the president's plan has hit one tiny snag. Mr. Carter wanted to go on television Sunday night, and word of that leaked so widely in Washington that one afternoon newspaper here headlined the Carter talk on Cuba on Sunday. Then the White House discovered that Sunday was the high holy Jewish holiday Yom Kippur. And so in some confusion, it rescheduled the speech for Monday night. Sam Donaldson, ABC News, the White House. They gave a lot of uh, TV network coverage to Connolly and Baker and these right-wing Republicans attacking Carter for being soft. So I think Carter really lost politically on this one. Also, after the, um, the speech that Carter made, where he outlined his plan, immediately the headlines in the 10 o'clock news were Russian troops to stay in Cuba, as if Carter had not really done anything and had therefore failed to be a strong uh, leader. Well, isn't there a certain justice in that, though, because this, this whole thing started with an operation Brzezinski and the CIA juned up to embarrass Cuba and the Soviets. And, uh, but President, they work for President Carter. The, the, the CIA is part of the White House. And, and, and Carter uh, permitted it, apparently encouraged it to be brought, brought out and made public and made into an international issue. And uh, in that sense, it's backfiring on him as a certain amount of justice. He had Secretary Vance make the, the statements and say, make an issue out of it, throw the gauntlet down, say the status quo is unacceptable. And the amateurishness of this administration was, was shown right then and there in that the status quo was unchangeable by the United States, except this, this very weak solution he came up with in the end, that, well, we can't do anything about the Soviets in Cuba. So 
uh, we'll increase our own military activity around. You always wonder uh, how much something like this was planned ahead of time since it had so much of an effect of encouraging the hawks and leader, leading to greater military activity and spending. How much of it was, was uh, determined ahead of time? Let's, let's make an issue of the Soviet troops there so we can get into this defense spending. Particularly since they'd known about it for 17 years. Since they'd known about it for 17 years. Well, I noticed uh, frequently that they would toss around the CIA as, well, we have good intelligence. I got a briefing by Stanfield Turner, blah, blah. They would be bringing it in as if that would automatically give the stamp of expertise on it. I was just in a briefing with Stanfield Turner, the head of the CIA, a few moments ago, and he believes that those troops are not there just to, to train Cubans. However, we do not know the mission of those troops. Early this morning, National Security Council members, including CIA Director Turner and Secretary of State Vance, arrived to continue talks with the president, which went on here until late last night about Senator Baker's suggestion that the president now release intelligence photographs of the Soviet troops in Cuba. ABC News diplomatic correspondent Barry Dunsmore reports the State Department will oppose doing that while negotiations are still underway. But if the talks break down, release of the evidence might be a good idea. It's amazing how they would dare to do that when you have this history of incredible, endless intelligence failures by the CIA. In crisis after crisis after crisis, the CIA coming up with faulty or false information. And uh, for them to cite Stansfield Turner a a in a situation like this. Remember the last U.S.-Cuban confrontation where, where uh, President Carter was calling uh, President Castro a liar and vice versa? was uh, a year and a half ago at the time the Katangis invaded the Shaba. And uh, President Carter said that we had intelligence that uh, it was a Cuban operation. And uh, Castro said it absolutely was not a Cuban operation, that it was Katangis and Cuba had nothing to do with it. And President Carter did much as they had there. He had CIA, you know, the CIA had information proving it. Eventually, it was resolved by some senators going down to Havana and meeting with Castro at his invitation, and he convinced them that there was reasonable doubt. And they went back and demanded and were shown the CIA's intelligence. And the 17 senators walked out of that meeting and said it didn't prove the, the presence of Cuba behind that invasion at all. In other words, in yet another situation, uh, President Carter uh, was not telling the truth. He was misinformed and he was distorting the information, lying, if you will. And uh, Fidel Castro was telling the truth. What amazes me, once again, is the absolute distortion of Gromyko speech and the Russians' uh, position. Uh, the Russians admitted they had troops there and that they'd been there for a long time. Gromyko said, you know, this is a foolish put-up job and let's forget about it and get on with the business of salt. And yet then the senators would come and say, Gromyko's lying. Yes. He's an absolute he, liar. He called it like it was. Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko today dismissed the American charge with a short, blunt demand, forget it. In his speech to the United Nations General Assembly, Mr. Gromyko said it was all part of a campaign to spread lies about the policies of Cuba and the Soviet Union. But the truth is that this propaganda is totally without foundation in reality. And our advice on this score is simple. It is high time that you honestly admit that this whole matter is artificial and proclaim it to be closed. Although Mr. Gromyko did not even mention the presence of Soviet troops in Cuba, it was clear this is what he was talking about. Just two weeks ago, the Soviet Union admitted it does have troops in Cuba, but only to train the Cubans in Soviet military hardware, that their duties and numbers have not changed in 17 years, and that any charges that organized Soviet combat units have arrived in Cuba are totally groundless. And Mr. Gromyko insisted that there's no reason for concern. The Soviet Union and other countries of the socialist community have never threatened anybody, nor are they threatening anybody now. This is Luciafi, ABC News at the United Nations. This is Ann Compton at the Capitol, where senators who have seen American intelligence photos say Gromyko is lying. I'm astonished 
there is simply no basis for doubting that the Soviet Union, that the Russians have a fully equipped, fully manned combat brigade in Cuba. I would hope that the president now would consider releasing the very, very reliable intelligence data we have, including aerial and satellite photography, to conclusively show that there are Russian combat troops in Cuba. Each senator pointed out that Gromyko was involved in another Cuban dispute, the 1962 missile crisis. I think the, the, the president uh, really has to be firm in this and just remind the American people that this is the same Mr. Gromyko who lied about missiles. And he was caught red-handed, and, and I regret that Mr. Gromyko has seen fit to, to state a bald-faced lie. That's what it is. Gromyko's intervention has had a chilling effect on the strategic arms treaty with the Soviets. A growing number of senators, including the man in control of the treaty, Foreign Relations Chairman Frank Church, say that unless the president can soon certify that the Russian combat forces have been dismantled, the SALT Treaty will be put on ice. It was not a good day today for the United States at the United Nations. Absolute liar. He called it like it was. He said that they were there. He, he said they were not assault troops. But they were there for training, and uh, certainly we have troops all over the world that are there to help install our, our, and train and use our, our military equipment, the hardware we've installed. We had for many years this huge unit in, in Addis Ababa. We have, of course, 5,000 troops on the Soviet border in Turkey. Uh, these troops uh, have no capability of invading Russia, for heaven's sake, but they are combat troops. They've all been trained in how to shoot rifles and whatnot. And I would say that uh, the only two people I saw in there who, who seemed to be candidly, uh, call three, I guess, calling it like it was, was uh, Senator Byrd, who said it was a non-crisis. Gromyko, who, who it appeared to me, called it like it was, said you're making something out of nothing for your own purposes. And then Fidel Castro also calling it like it was. And, and Andrew Young. Also. And Andrew Young, yes. Y que nosotros llamamos centro de instrucción. Which we call training center. Está en Cuba. Desde hace 17 años. Has been in Cuba for the past 17 years. Yes. Esa instalación militar. Now then, that military facility fue creada al final de la crisis de octubre de 1960. Was established at the end of the October crisis in 1962. In 1962. Conforme al espíritu de los acuerdos in conformity with the spirit of the agreements de octubre de ese año. Signed on October of that year. Y dentro del status quo establecido como consecuencia de la crisis. And within the status quo that was set up as a result of the October crisis. Yeah. Why has he brought this problem to the light now to create the situation? Por, porque el hecho de que esté en crisis Because la reacción de Carter. Because the fact that Carter's uh, situation is in a crisis. No le da derecho a poner en crisis. Does not give him the right paz. to place peace into a crisis. Y yo pienso que la actuación de Carter en relación a este problema. And I believe that Carter's behavior concerning sido, this problem ha sido has been dishonest, ha sido insincera, has been unsincere, ha sido immoral, has been immoral, y ha estado engañando a la opinión and pública has been mundial, deceiving the world public opinion, y a la opinión pública de Estados Unidos. and the U.S. public opinion. Andrew Young bowed out as a diplomat, speaking his mind, as usual. Last night he spoke to 5,000 blacks, and at a time when the administration has been saying it's gravely concerned over those Soviet combat troops in Cuba, Young ridiculed the threat. If the Russians made a move against us, our defenses are strong enough to ignore and wipe out and obliterate some 3,000 Cubans and, I mean, Russians in Cuba. What the hell can they do to the United States of America? That is a totally irrelevant political issue that has nothing to do with the national security of this nation. More relevant, Young said, is inflation and unemployment, more of a threat than troops in Cuba. Then, Young philosophized about what he thinks is wrong with foreign policy. It's not some amorphous strategic concept decided by some folk that ain't never fought no wars, don't know nothing about suffering, never been poor, and essentially in isolate themselves 
in some ivory tower writing papers and theorizing to each other. Those are the folk. Those essentially are the folk that have created the mess that the world is now in. Andrew Young's beautiful comment. And the other people, wow. John, don't you think that uh, the network news is irresponsible in failing to give this broader context for the story and leaving out the fact that this was a uh, story based on leaks that really gave no new information and the way they played this up night after night and gave all these hawks uh, such a uh, pervasive coverage. You know, our, our enemies overseas, we talk about communist censorship of the press. And uh, the communists talk about our censorship of the press, or our press working for the government. And as we sit here, we find this an incredible charge fr from the communists, because we know that we have freedom of the press. Uh, you can go out and start a newspaper with a mimeograph machine and print more or less what you want, and you probably won't be eliminated the next day by the FBI, although that has been known to happen. But uh, it, the fact is that while you can't claim plausibly, and I wouldn't, that the New York Times or the Washington Post uh, or Time Magazine or Newsweek, the biggies, uh, are actually controlled by the administration, not in the sense of the administration calling them up and saying, here's our line on this issue, everybody do it. The press plays directly into the hands of the ad administration. It's the voice of a given administration. The press has gotten us into uh, incredible situations in the world, devastating situations in the world, such as uh, the Vietnam War. If the, if the Vietnam War, if the press had been conscientious in nailing the administration on its lies and distortions during the Vietnam War, during the buildup of the Vietnam War, it never would have happened. If they had balked then, if they had had interviews with people and then had someone come on, afterwards saying, unfortunately, that all of that's untrue. See, the press tries, it claims it presents the facts. And facts are, are uh, if President Carter or Scoop Jackson or Goldwater, someone makes a speech, that is a fact that he made that speech and said those words. Now, the fact that all of those words were false uh, is never clarified to the public. So the administration can use the press to, to put out whatever it wants to on a given situation, and the press will play along for the sense of drama, and, as they say, to sell newspapers. So you have crises like this that could never have existed if the press had nailed them at the outset and said, this is nonsense. It's a non-crisis. There's another irony here in that during this very uh, period, the Russians um, went to East Germany in, in a very big uh, flourish. They said they were going to take 20,000 Russian troops out of East Germany and we were going to withdraw a lot of their forces from uh, Central Europe. And this was hardly covered. There were only seconds of coverage, whereas this seemed to be a major change in uh, Soviet uh, policy and a potential thaw in Europe, which could be much more important than this non-event in Cuba. And yet, this was barely mentioned. This is how the press can create some stories and how they don't even uh, cover. You've got, to, you've got to remember, and this is why I titled my book In Search of Enemies, it's necessary to our system of government to have people to oppose and people to hate. If you'll look, for example, uh, I believe it was yesterday, President Carter just finished a small political swing. Uh, he made uh, repeated statements about Cuba, Cuba's aggressive posture, Cuba's military, the, the, the Cuba being the, the most militarized country in the world, etc. Surely we have things that are more important uh, than Cuba to, to this nation right now. The collapsing economy, the galloping inflation, all of the various uh, minority groups that are still suffering persecution in this country. He, he, nevertheless, he focuses on Cuba and makes them into an enemy which they have no desire to be so that we've got somebody to hate, to oppose, so that we've got an excuse to thump our chest and build up our military machine. And he's doing this, obviously, as a, a major element in his presidential campaign, searching for enemies, looking for people that don't want to fight us, uh, that we, we need to have somebody to oppose. I think there's also kind of a long-range thing that they're looking forward to here, also. 
uh, you read some books and see some statements by the high muckety mucks, and they complain that the Vietnam War has had such a devastating effect on public opinion that they can't wheel and deal around the world now like they used to because public opinion would not uh, allow it. People would uh, hit the streets again. So I think this is part of an overall policy of trying to whip up the Cold War rhetoric and look for enemies, like you say, so that people will become hawkish and accept a more uh, militant stance and activist stance around the world. As a matter of fact, it re resulted in the poll, which was mentioned by AP and NBC. The Associated Press poll shows Americans, by three to one, want the SALT Treaty held up by the Senate until the Russian troops are moved out of Cuba. 66% said hold up the treaty, 22% said don't, the others didn't know. John, how would you comment on Carter's speech on this incident where he claimed that Cuba was a puppet, a satellite of the Soviet Union, it was an economic uh, failure? Do you think that's an accurate uh, account? Well, you notice uh, Fidel Castro was on uh, 60 Minutes uh, the night before President Carter's big speech on this subject. And uh, he called President Carter dishonest on this, this subject. And then the next night, uh, Carter went on television, and it was almost as though he set out to prove Castro right. His presentation of the facts was so distorted, and he left out these, these glaring omissions that would give some balance to the thing, that would have explained it and put it into its perspective. Things like uh, Cuba's long-standing and repeated offer, overture to us to normali normalize relations, uh, which we have consistently spurned. Uh, the presence, he did not mention the presence of, uh, of our Marine Corps base on Cuban soil. Now, mind you, if the Soviets had troops on U.S. soil or Cuban troops on U.S. soil, it would be a different thing. But we actually maintain a Marine Corps base on Cuban soil. He made a big thing out of the, the, the Cuba's dependency, economic dependency on the Soviet Union, and he called it uh, Cuba the economic failure of communism. He didn't point out that we've had a 20-year economic war against Cuba, that it's a long ways from Russia and it's very close to us. This war has included, of course, the, the assassination attempts on the leader and the propaganda efforts to, to, to disrupt the morale of the country. But aside from all that, projects to destroy their sugar crops. Uh, and, and, and Cuba is almost totally dependent on its sugar, for one thing. Uh, a, a blockade of Cuba for many, many years. Embargo on the sale of many things to Cuba. We did everything we could to make them into our enemy and to force them into the arms of the Soviet Union, to force them to be dependent on the Soviet Union. We could have taken the opposite policy and tried to help them get established economically so that they could be part of the community of nations and not be aligned with the Soviet Union. We pushed them into the arms of the Soviet Union. He didn't bother to point that out. This, it's the greatest irony, I think the hardest thing for Americans to, to understand and realize and face and accept is that our presidents have now a tradition of being the most duplicious of any world leaders. Our presidents lie the most as a matter of policy because of the secrecy establishment. Now, it was, it was absolute proof of the pudding of the whole thing about the CIA. This was another CIA operation that got out of hand, a rogue elephant, they like to call them, that put, uh, that it jeopardized SALT II and put the United States in the position of being ridiculed in the eyes of the world and preoccupied our government for three weeks until Carter finally did you notice how, when he was on television, how he kept smirking? <laughs> he would be talking very seriously about all these heavy things, and then he would kind of give his, his, little, his little grin. He couldn't repress it because he knew what a joke this whole thing was. There, were, there was no crisis. But at the same time, it had become a crisis in the sense that salt, too, was at stake. Well, Al Slavinsky is going to join us now, and we'll proceed with... Uh more in-depth discussion of this and other um, other items which might be on your mind. It's clear to me this is a pseudo issue, but I'm not clear of how the CIA is behind this. Okay, you have to read between the lines only a little bit. 
to understand the CIA's role because it has been stated uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, I would be more alert to what these statements meant, having been part of these things before. But every three years, there's the, the Non-Aligned Nations Conference. And every three years, nine months before the conference, the CIA mounts a massive operation to discredit, disrupt, and manipulate this conference. In, uh, in 19, uh, whenever it was, 1970, uh, the big issue was China was trying to get into the United Nations. And uh, we were uh, uh, leaning in the direction of talking directly to China. But the, the thrust of the Non-Aligned Nations Conference operation was to get all of the dele delegates possible to, to oppose endorsing the entry of China into the United Nations. I was involved in that when I had an agent who was uh, an intellectual third world figure uh, who was a, 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 an official in his government who could go to this conference. And so I was leaned on by headquarters. Every station, CIA station in the world gets these cables saying not just do you have anyone who would go, but they go through your files back at headquarters and find out what agents you have and come in and say send in our intellect to this place and tell him what to say. And I got out my agent and, and leaned on him and said, uh, uh, this is the line you've got to take vis-a-vis -vis China. And he said, wait a minute. He said, wait a minute. He said, my, my country is very poor. We need China. We need a relation with China. You're ordering me to sabotage my country's interests for one of your political ploys when everybody can see that the United States is in the process of going to bed with China in her own economic interests. He said, how can I do that? And ours, too. Yeah. And so I, I, I went back to headquarters and said that he was not responsive. And so they sort of put an X on how well he stood as a disciplined agent and wrote, you know, little things about, you know, I didn't have complete control of all my agents. Well, we shouldn't d really dismiss the Cuban thing as being a Mickey Mouse situation. Well, because here's what happened. There's going to be an increase in defense spending because oh. of it. There's going to be increased military grandest, presidents. It's, it's, it has turned out, it's a tempest in a teapot, but it, one, it jeopardized salt. I think that'll blow over and people get exactly. over that. But it has, it has wound up when, when we're, we were moving in the direction of support for SALT and a reduction of strategic weapons and military posturing, that's, that's what these treaties should be about, it has wound up to be a victory for the Hawks in the, in the Defense Department and, and in the CIA and as well. And also, this, this is kind of reminiscent of the days when Hoover would create a threat uh, and go out and stomp it down and get more money from Congress in the process. Isn't the CIA doing the same thing? Exactly, um, although I don't, knowing them as, as I feel I, I do, as I, I did and I believe I still do, I don't think that they are, uh, they have enough mind about, there's enough of, a, of a, an intellect driving what they do. They always have these Non-Aligned Nations Conference. This time it's a biggie because it's in Cuba and it's the old CIA nemesis. Castro is running it. This is the man the CIA tried eight times to kill. He's tried to destroy uh, uh, Cuba's sugar crops and whatnot. He, uh, we forced, the CIA's forced him to be totally dependent on the Soviet Union economically. And he has, he has stuck his finger in the CIA's eye over the years time and time again and gotten away with it. And he's doing it again 90 miles from our own shores. So the CIA was obviously incensed. And, and by that, I, when you say CIA in that context, you mean the intelligence establishment. Because there are people who don't work in the language, like, the big new Brzezinski, for example, that don't work in the CIA, but they're part of the same complex. And uh, it's now, it's, it's been admitted by the White House that uh, Brzezinski met with the CIA, 40 committee meetings, uh, are, are the operations advisory group meetings with the CIA director, and ordered the CIA to focus on Cuba and focus on their vulnerabilities and focus on Soviets in Cuba. And this was this. They admitted that this began last March, and so they focused on the, their operation to discredit Castro. Well, tell me, uh, how have you changed since the last time we saw you? You had written the book in search of enemies, and it was doing well, and people were talking perhaps about doing a movie, and you were trying to get on the uh, you know, lecture series. Have all these good things come about, or? Has the CIA been after your uh, defected Fanny? Or what's you know, happening? you know, I don't, I, I really don't feel that I've changed one bit through this whole experience, except 
a bit of broadening, a bit more confidence in mankind on one side and a bit more cynical perhaps on the other. Uh, yes, I've lectured all over the nation uh, three dozen times, I guess, on uh, different universities. I've appeared on television in every corner of the nation. Uh, but I still you? feel like the same old country boy. <laughs> uh, how have you been received? Uh, and the reception, that's where the, the experience has been so rewarding. You know, inside the CI, you very much uh, have the feeling of belonging to a religious order. Uh, that's not how you would verbalize it inside the CI, but that's the effect. You, you live with CI people, you socialize with CI people, and you have quite a feeling that outsiders, the rest of the world, are, are hostile and misguided. And uh, that inside the CIA you're safe and you're with people you can trust and people who view the world correctly. And uh, it, it was the most refreshing thing about leaving the CIA and getting outside and meeting people in the press and the media and universities around the nation was to find how many really decent people they are, there are who, who are working hard for things they believe in and are quite responsive to someone who's, who's made a gesture, uh, as, as I have, to, to a moral gesture. And uh, lecturing, for example, I've, as I say, I've lectured, I guess, three dozen times. I haven't counted, but many, many times. And I have yet to have one lecture that did not go hours beyond the prescribed time. Even when I had to catch an airplane, they would still keep me for hours. Uh, a lecture, you know, would be scheduled for an hour, an hour and a half, and 15 minutes of uh, questions, and it would go on, in fact, uh, until midnight, one o'clock, with people asking questions and the discussion just flowing, and then, more often than not, go somewhere to drink beer and talk on until three or four in the morning. The interest is extremely high in this subject of, of the secret government and governmental abuses, the encroachment of the government on individuals inside our society, but also on, uh, on the peoples of the world. Speaking of which, John, have you been contacted or pressured by the CIA? There was a threat that they were going to sue. They had sued Frank Schnepp for publishing his book about the CIA, and you were worried last time you were here that you might be sued also. Have you heard anything from the CIA well, recently? When they, when they sued Schnepp, which was... Uh, spring a year ago, his book came out a few months before mine did, uh, which I regret because I, I, I think my book was a much better book in a moral sense, not quality of writing or anything, but uh, the government got to him first just before my book came out and sued him and made SNEP a test case. Then my book came out and uh, unofficially they were you know, talking in Washington, it was clear that the government was frustrated that they moved against him instead of me, and I was frustrated because there was going to be a SNEP precedent instead of a Stockwell precedent. And I think I would have put up a fight that would have been much more effective for this reason. Uh, SNEP believes in the CIA. He believes in covert action against the, the third world countries. He believes in secrecy. His only complaint was that in Vietnam there was a scandal at the end and it was covered up in the evacuation of Vietnam. I believe that the CIA is, is a, a, a moral uh, tragedy and that it's discredited the United States and that it should be closed down, that we should revert to openness and telling, telling it like it is and telling the truth to people. I think secrecy doesn't work. I think it masks and provides a cover for people to do things which would definitely be unacceptable to the society at large. There's nothing they do that is forthright, positive, that you can stand up in church or wherever you go and say, I'm, you know, this is what I did last week and I'm proud of it. Overseas it's all. You're a secret operative. That means your existence there is a lie. You're pretending to be a diplomat or a scholar or something which you're not. Uh, you're getting information covertly and that means, I mean, we have diplomats in these countries who talk to people endlessly. If the information is overtly available, uh, they will get it. You're there to bribe and to induce people to be spies, to commit treason. And you're also there to instigate activities, uh, meaning subversion. Now, these are heavy crimes in every country in the world, normally punishable by death. This is what the CIA does. And I think you also made the point before, a well-taken point again, 
that if we just went into some of these countries and, and, and bought them with money, we'd be doing a lot more for our American interests than if we tried to insidiously you know, overthrow their governments, uh, give LSD to their leaders, uh, hire prostitutes to be filmed in, in, in compromising positions with other leaders. If we just went in and just pumped some money into them, and, and we could probably buy more friends that way than what the CIA has been doing over the last 20 years or so. And, and uh, I even hedge a little bit at the word buy friends. Uh, you know, they have a, in the CIA, we had a saying that uh, uh, you, you, can, you can rent an African, but you can't buy him. <laughs> and, uh, because, you know, you make payments to people, and, and uh, as long as it's in their interest to work with you, they will. And then when you run out of, uh, yeah, the situation changes, they're going to work, continue to work in their interest, which may not be parallel to yours any longer. But the point is that there are certain techniques of interpersonal and international relations which work on the long term. And lying, cheating, de deceit, and skullduggery don't work in the long term. You put yourself down. Yes, if we would go in with this $13 billion alone and deal overtly with people, I, I'm sure, and work for, sincerely for human rights, and for democratic action so that those countries can try to have governments like our own and systems like our own, surely we would be further ahead than we are right now. What well, about intelligence gathering, if they did that without the dirty tricks and all of that? Is that possible, you think? Well, this question always comes up, and I've, I've thought about it a great deal for years now. And I conclude, my own personal conclusion is quite firm that the quality of our intelligence would be much greater if we did not have the CIA's covert collection uh, systems. If you've read anything about the CIA and kept up with it, you've noticed that the CIA has a long history of, of colossal intelligence failures. I don't mean covert operations that exploded in our face and splattered us with, with foul propaganda and presence around the world. But uh, I mean failure to, to advise the United States government on what is happening in a given situation in the world. One of the more dramatic ones recently was uh, Iran a year ago, where the, the week that Iran fell apart, that it broke down completely, leading directly to the Shah's ouster, the CIA had in its typewriters uh, a report, a national intelligence uh, estimate, that uh, there was no serious opposition to the Shah <laughs> in Iran. You have one side of the house, the operators, of which I was one, out there recruiting spies and gathering intelligence. Mm -hmm. You have the other side of the house are PhDs and people with master's degrees who are professional analysts. Mm -hmm. And theoretically, the system should produce good intelligence. The argument they always throw out is that the CIA, you have to have the human agent to find out what people intend to do. You can get their capabilities from their missile uh, manuals and whatnot, but what they intend to do with those missiles, you have to have uh, an agent penetration. The fallacy of this is that, uh, look at our own White House. Who would you have to have as your spy in the White House to know what the White House is going to do? I mean, obviously, the White House doesn't know what it's going to do in a given situation until usually a day or two after it's done it. Particularly this one. And, uh, <laughs> particularly this one, but the next one, one was, yeah. wasn't much better, and you would have had to have had Henry Kissinger in your pocket to have an estimate of what was being done and what he was going to do. Spies are the most unreliable source of information that can be had. A spy is, by definition almost, a person of abnormal psychology. Normal people don't betray their countries. Yeah. Abnormal people do betray their countries for various reasons. A spy can be uh, a, an adventurer who's out to have fun, making up information, a fabricator for various reasons, a double agent working for his own country and for you, or working for his own country against you, or working for the French against both you and Russia. And you add this all up, inside the CIA, we took our own spy information with huge doses of salt. I could go on and on and on with, with illustrations. I think of that. the point that you made that well, was well taken last time that you were on the show was that um, an agency that spends over ten billion dollars a year uh, collects now less 13. than oh less than, okay thirteen billion collects a lot less than ten percent of the actual hardcore intelligence. I think uh, what was the exact percentage that you said? Yeah, we were told inside the CIA on uh, uh, things like mid career course that the clandestine services uh, collect. 
uh, about 4% of the total gross uh, input. And of that, clearly, a trivial amount was important. We all knew that. But we always lived for that one report that you'd get that would be a big report that would tell everything. But see, the problem with secrecy in an intelligence business is that it, it look at the academic world and try to picture it if you were able to write your thesis to convince one person, your, your, your monitor, your, your, your professor, and no one else. Uh, you could go to the professor and find out what his biases were, and he didn't have to convince anyone else but the dean. And you could go to him, you could go to the two of you and have dinner with the dean and find out how he felt about that subject, and you go back and write it to make sure he's pleased, and that way you get your, your degree. And you're happy and you succeed. Uh, and the quality of the information plummets, obviously. In the CIA, you have to convince your boss and his boss, and it goes up the chain of command to what will sell to the very secret, very tight intelligence uh, establishment. And you don't have to convince anyone else, and you can ask them first what they want you to write. And this is how you get situations like in, in Iran, where you're reporting that the Shah is very stable because the president liked the Shah. The, <laughs> the, before uh, this president, the others liked the Shah. There's a great interrelationship of someone like the Shah with his billions of dollars and our own moneyed establishment. Well, oh, there's also and a big relationship between the uh, secret uh, service, uh, the Sabak, mm -hmm. of the and Iranian And the CIA, and the CIA. oh yeah. They feed each other information. The CIA put the Shah in power and helped him organize the Sabak. And there's no way that you could get a report up through the chain of command in the CIA saying that the Shah was bankrupt. It would not sell. You'd get it, you, you, it would be torn up. It would not get published. And I believe you mentioned last time you were on the show that the, um, the CIA has helped directly or indirectly train most of the rep repressive police forces in the, in the world, including um, uh, Uganda, including Brazil, where they were torturing priests and what have you. In the Philippines and Korea, the KCI, KCI, yeah. uh, Savak, uh, Mobutu and Zaire, uh, the, the the emperor in, in Ethiopia, his police force, these were all CIA liaison uh, developed organizations. We didn't train them all. We're not the only uh, people in the world who indul indulge in unfortunate police activities. The KGB, I don't think the CIA trained. <laughs> John, doesn't uh, the CIA and its processes of secrecy also undermine our own democracy at home? that if the policies are being made and carried out, information gathered, that's only accessible to a few people. You have government by a corporate elite mm -hmm. that's not responsible mm -hmm. to the democratic mm -hmm. process. And again and again, we paid for this. Government by the people doesn't work if you have a secret government. Just forget it. Stop right there. <laughs> and it's a fallacy that this is a more effective way of government because we've seen again and again that this creates disasters, whether we're talking about Iran and Vietnam, that the corporate elite is not so all-powerful or so efficient, and that maybe it's better to trust the people and to debate some of the policies and have ideas out in the open. You know, I watch on things like this Tom Snyder show on NBC where the... The, the Turner is, is on and given uh, n uh, national prime time to say that people who attack the CIA, like Stockwell and others, Bill Shep and others, are un-American. They're traitors, was his word, and his eyes glinted while he right. said that. And uh, that's, that's Admiral you know, who Turner, right? is American? Admiral Turner, the director hey. of the CIA. Now, who is American? Turner insists on secrecy, and he's lobbying for laws to put people like me in jail for going to the American people and telling what we've done in America's name with America's tax dollars. And I ask you, who is American? Who is the traitor to the American system? The John Stockwells and Frank Snepps and others who are exercising the American principle of participating, of working together to discuss what our country is doing and try to influence it. Lord knows I might be wrong in my position towards Angola or, or any position in the world, but it's the American process to stand up and thrash it out. And to debate it, to get both sides out in the open and to see which side has the most merits and to let the people Ex decide. In Angola, we would not have had that war, I warrant, if there had been public debate. You had Henry Kissinger and Bill Colby of the CIA wanted this war. Uh, and they got it because they were able to do it in secrecy. They lied to the Senate in order to get it done. The American interests that were in Angola were significant. You had Gulf Oil and Boeing doing business with the Angolan government. They were not permitted to vote, to discuss, to participate in the decision to go to war in Angola. They were distressed 
when it happened, when they found out. They were, they were put out of business temporarily by this secret war. The American churches had extensive missionary organizations inside Angola, and they were not permitted to, to participate in the decision to go into Angola. And, and, of course, the American scholars who were working in Angola, traveling the exchanges, they were not permitted to participate. You had two individuals engineer this war who had never been to Angola, and one of them had never set foot in Africa in his life. Neither of them were Africanists, even, and they engineered a war and got it done because of secrecy. That's a very good point that you raised, uh, uh, a fact that not very many people know is that the CIA has been engaging or, or trying to start these wars uh, throughout the country, at least as far back as the days of Alan Dulles. Uh, when Alan Dulles tried to get Nixon interested in starting a war in Laos back in 54 and 55, mm -hmm. and when that fell through, he later um, reputedly took uh, marine helicopters out of Laos, flew them into Saigon Airport, and created a threat where there had been none before, mm -hmm. and, and hence our involvement in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. was Alan Dulles' attempt to start a war over there, which he later was successful in doing, although Kennedy and Johnson have taken most of the blame for the escalation of the war. I'm but glad you said that, because I say it every time I lecture, this, this, we're not playing with little secret operations that affect no one. Our, our economic problems now are greatly tied to this $165 billion disaster in Vietnam. That was a CI operation for at least seven years before we began an overt military campaign. The, the CIA was deeply involved in a secret war in Southeast Asia and trying to get the United States government involved. The first whistleblower was a gentleman named Paul Sakwa, who was not, because of the mood of the nation and the press and whatnot, was not given an audience. He did not succeed in speaking out. He didn't have quite the whatever it takes to write a book and get it published, but he resigned his job in the early 60s in protest over the CIA's efforts to, to lobby, to bullshit the American public about what was happening in Vietnam. And he quit because the station in Saigon was putting out false information, consciously discussing their ploys to lobby to get the Americans to wake up to the threat and do, quote, the right thing. The CIA, remi remember, has published, by then it had published, a couple of thousand English language books, that means for American consumption, that were secretly published by the CIA, paying someone to write a book. And, and many of those books at that time were about Vietnam. John, ha how have you ha succeeded in getting your message across to the American people? Have the mass media been uh, open and willing to discuss your more radical ideas about uh, abolishing the CIA? Are they willing to debate this? Last time I talked to you on the phone, you were talking about a letter that you'd written to the New York Times or a column for the op-ed page about the abolition of the CIA. Did they ever publish that? No. Uh, the initial reaction of the press and the mass media to me was, was quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say there was 98 or 99 percent favorable. The one exception was the Washington Post, which is a conspicuously Washington establishment newspaper and very close to the CIA. Uh, but since the, the initial impact of publicity of who is John Stockwell and what does he have to say, at simultaneously as the months have tracked, there's been a change in the stance of our, of our government, our establishment, including our press establishment, uh, responding to President Carter's line and Vice President Mondale's line and Admiral Turner's lobbying to get off the CIA's back and permit it to get back to work. And this is very conspicuous if you read the editorial uh, sections of the Washington Post and the New York Times and Time Magazine and Newsweek. It's, I mean, it's not a covert, subtle thing. They're coming out and saying it. Let's get off. Uh, get off the CIA's back and let them get back to work. Well, of course, work, you know, for the CIA is, is heinous crimes against humanity. That's their function. Doesn't this show something very disturbing, and that is how the mass media and the political establishment go along with these CIA uh, games that they're dupes, or are they willing accomplices? How do you read the role of the media? You know, I was complaining about issue? exactly this just a couple of days ago to a friend of mine on the New York Times and another friend on the Washington Post on the long distance uh, telephone, pointing out that our press has accepted a stance which makes it sort of the, the, the willing uh, uh, participant in such government misdeeds and ploys and, and, and blunders. Uh, 
what the press does essentially is they report they try to report facts there are obvious biases and whatnot but essentially they report facts if president carter makes a speech the word it's a fact that he made a speech and it's a fact that he said this that or the other the fact that everything he said is a lie the press doesn't take it as their responsibility to point that out so what they do is when a crisis like this develops they quote they have you know there's the the fact that the president said such and so and somebody else and somebody else and senator church and and, and uh, uh senator jackson and who was a senator from florida and their lies and misstates statements and exaggerations are, are become the issue even though they're false and even though everyone involved in the press knows that they're false no one in the press points this out to the readers this seems even the ed the ed editors who write their columns rarely tackle the president or the secretary of state or even a, an admiral turner they will take him on sometime but they how often do you read uh, an an article did you after the the president's speech the other night uh, about this crisis where th was there any editorial in a major newspaper that said that he he lied on point after point after point well you know one thing john pointed out before when he was on the show that the cia uh, is now i guess and, and admitted that they have bought journalists in the past mm -hmm. but you also pointed out that a lot of events were staged for the benefit of the press and stories are, of course, spoon-fed to the press um, by the CIA, and most of these go unchallenged. Well, there's a social relationship and class relationship with the upper people who control the newspapers and, and run the newspapers, boy the network. old boy network. This has been pointed out by, you know, um, many months back when they were talking about CIA and press relationships. Well, the press people, uh, the top members of the press, meet in the Bilderberg Group along with members of the CIA. They're in the same... Uh, social clubs they know each other on a personal basis so naturally there's going to be a relationship and what what evolves is uh, the end result of all this is that the cia's existence in the 50s and the 60s when it galloped so f it, it got so far out of line drug sex experiments on unwitting american guinea pigs uh, uh assassination attempts of world leaders some successful some successful and and many many uh crimes that you can only describe as depraved uh and vietnam war and the angola and war and coups and these things were were permissible this this evolution of this organization was possible only with the indulgence of the press if the press had been alert had been smoking this organization out had been reporting that the cia is doing this that and the other it could never have gotten by with it. This is my big disappointment now, is to see the nation, the establishment turning, and the press establishment. This is what I said over the phone just yesterday, I think, the last conversation was in this series of conversations, was just that, that we're heading right back where we were with the indulgence of the press. The press is cooperating with the government to put the CI back in action just where it was. Mind you, we've gone through all of these exposures of 1975 and 76, and, and the CIA's charter has actually been expanded in the last three years since then. Well, John, you were talking about the press and the fact that they have not performed this watchdog function. Even when they have the opportunity, such as your letter to the New York Times, tell us about that. Well, there have been, there've been a couple. I don't, I don't have the time to spend a lot of time writing all the letters that occur to me, obviously. I think we all have that syndrome of reading something and say, boy, I'd like to answer that myself. And occasionally I, I read something that I really do feel like I have something valid to say. But uh, last year I got a call from an editor of the New York Times who said that uh, they had run an article from Congressman Stratton, a letter calling for a stronger expanded CIA and deploring the fact that the nation was weak because the CIA was in trouble, it was broken down. They had run a letter from Admiral Turner saying, don't worry about it, we, we need help, we need your support, but, but we're still out there pitching, so don't, don't worry about it too much, uh, but give us your help. And this guy, whose, I believe, mind and heart are, are pretty honest and pretty much in the right place, called me and he said, we've got to have somebody come in and say, wait a minute, you know, the other side of that is is calling for a closure of the CIA and so why don't you write that one Stockwell and I spent three weeks I didn't do anything else I wrote this thing and I rewrote it I talked to him on the phone I rewrote it I rewrote it I rewrote it I rewrote it 
and they never ran it. Did they ever tell you why? I talked to him endlessly, but essentially it boiled down. Uh, at the end, he, he, he quit returning my phone calls because he was getting embarrassed because essentially the, the, the one editor comes up with an article he likes and he shops it around the other editors and if they all sort of agree, it gets momentum going until the boss says, okay, let's run with it. And he couldn't get the momentum. The, 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 they just weren't going to run an article that was anti-CIA and they did not. And my own experience, by the way, uh, in dealing with the New York Times that time and three other occasions uh, and dealing with the Washington Post, where I've also published, is that the, the New York Times is, uh, is at least ten times as enlightened as the Washington Post. Well, this most recent letter which you wrote to the New York Times also reveals the same type of thinking. You wrote to them about the Cuban uh, situation. Did you not? Yes, I, I wrote to him about the Cuban situation, and uh, I must admit this time I was wiser and more experienced, and also the editor that I was talking to was quite candid with me and quite straightforward, and uh, he told me the reasons quite promptly why they couldn't run it. It was very frustrating to me because I thought it should be run, and he would say he agreed, and then he would say, but it's not going to run. And so obviously it just, you know, in, in the, that that small group of people, that article is not going to get priority over the others. But the, the same principle is that no one has pointed out on, in an international organ, a Western international organ, that this thing started with a CI operation which got out of hand. It was a little bit more successful than the CI ever dreamed. And politics. John, you've been traveling a lot. Uh, in trying to help get established to make arrangements for a documentary which will be produced by BBC and be shown hopefully on PBS and then hopefully by the affiliates. There's a lot of hope along the line there. Uh, you've made uh, three trips to Cuba. What are your impressions of Cuba and the Cuban people and the system they have down there? You know, I, when I went to Cuba the first time I felt a, a little bit like uh, uh, one of these Longhorn football players might feel if during OU week he found himself up in Oklahoma and uh, he's walking around with people and he finds they're really nice people. You know, the hysteria that you get and the bad guys down there in Cuba. I've been so brainwashed even trying to be intelligent and see through our CIA propaganda. I had been so brainwashed against communism that I, I just, uh, I couldn't believe what I actually saw in Cuba. Now mind you, the the nature and mentality of the Cuban people is, I'm sure, vastly different from the Soviets uh, in the Soviet Union. I've not been to Moscow, and from everything I read about it, and I'm not sure how much of it's CIA written books and how much of it's legitimate books, I'm not eager to go, except maybe as a tourist. It strikes me as a fairly bleak uh, climate and a political atmosphere that I wouldn't want to live in. but. Uh, that may not be the fault of communism. I got down in Cuba and I found people were incredibly open. You know, you have the stereotype of the oppressive communist state where people are afraid to talk and they're afraid to talk to a foreigner and everything. And uh, they were urging me to go out on the streets and talk to anyone I wanted to. And we would have these conversations. They wanted to tell me about their system. They're proud of it. A lot of fun. They wanted to tell me about the operations they had run. They wanted to brag about how they had clobbered us in Angola and whatnot. And, you know, you're sitting there at, uh, at, at uh, a dinner, you know, hosted by the film, uh, uh, National Film Company, and uh, present at that particular dinner of eight people or something was uh, a member of the Central Committee. And, you know, it's kind of a little bit heavy, and, and uh, uh, some party commissar, and then a couple of people make films, and then one interpreter, and uh, because I don't speak Spanish very well. And... Uh, this one guy from the Film Institute, everybody else orders uh, mojitos, this national drink down there, except him. He, he orders a Brandy Alexander. And uh, then he proceeds for 45 minutes to tell us all how he's really an anarchist. He says, <laughs> I have this communism and everything. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's better than capitalism for Cuba, but basically I don't believe in any government, much less communism or capitalism. And he goes on and on with this. And the Central Committee member is arguing with him, and they're pouring their drinks and having... And, uh, you know, this isn't the way you visualize mm -hmm. a communist country working. They have, they have, Cuba was, uh, 
you know, this is abundantly documented. It was the, the brothel, the whorehouse of, of the West, of, of the United States. It was where you went to play. Playground for the mafia. Playground for the mafia, playground for the rich New York bankers, for the people in America who had money. They went to Cuba to play. Uh, it wasn't a very good deal for the Cuban people. Eighty percent of the country was owned by outside money. From, from the sugar lands to the banks to what factories there were, it was owned by outside. Uh, Castro got power, organized it along communist lines, and now the country belongs to the people. And there is no way that CIA propaganda can, can make a case that the people in Cuba regret that. They have so much more of a stake in what's going on in their country, and they're so proud of it. Now, there are exceptions. And this is what they kept telling me. They said, get out and talk to people, and you're going to find people who are unhappy, and they're going to tell you problems. And we haven't solved all our problems. Lord knows every time we solve a problem, we create two more. But we're trying, and we think the people are involved. And that's what it appeared to me. They're certainly more involved than they were 20 years ago when they were owned by, by the mafia. John, did you see uh, evidence of increased democratization going on in Cuba. They had some local elections, I think, last year f for the first time. And Fidel seemed to say that, well, before the people weren't ready for elections, but now they've had experience, political experience, education, and they're ready and we're going to have more and more democracy. Did you get a sense that democracy was on the rise there? Do you have any... Uh, well, I very much did. Uh, I, I went, I, was, I visited schools, and I visited apartment complexes, and I talked to people about how is, you know, how is it working? How do you elect your representative, and who does, you know, who, who, who gets to vote? And we would go into schools. Now, obviously, uh, my two trips there where I'm very busy working on a film project, which does not have, uh, it, it has 20 or 30 percent to do with Cuba, doesn't make me an authority on Cuba. I'm not a Cuban scholar. I haven't been deep into the place. I've seen sort of, you know, whirlwind tours through here and there. When they would take me on these tours, they would sort of point to a, a side of town where, which was built up in the last 20 years, and then they'd make me say where to turn and make me say where to stop and make me say what building to go into and what floor to stop on and which door to knock on to talk to people. So they, they really were trying to make an effort to, to let me find people to talk to. And uh, I came away with the, uh, the very definitely the strong impression that the people are involved, but they're also involved in electing their own officials now. Again, I hedge a little bit because I'm not a Cuban scholar or an authority on Cuba. I understand your book is out of paperback now. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. How's the distribution of that going, do you know? It's gone extremely well, but we did not get a mass market sale. Norton brought it out in paperback, and we got, uh, the best I could tell, bookstores around the nation began running it in April, and they still are. And it is selling. It's selling quite well. It's an interesting thing you learn when you write a book, and of course, you know, you want to get a uh, paperback sale and you want to get a movie on it. Any author wants these things to happen. Uh, paperback sales are, it, the paperback business is perhaps one of the squirreliest of uh, the, the nation's businesses. The, the, the reasons that they will give you for choosing one book and not another one are incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. Things like, for example, I mean, my book, Frank Snepp's book, uh, my book about the C.I. Snepp's book about uh, the evacuation of the U.S. from, from Vietnam uh, did not get a mass market sale, but Phil Caputo's book, Rumors of War, about a uh, Marine lieutenant's experience in Vietnam 10 years ago and how he was disgusted with the war and whatnot was, was a million dollar paperback, hyped and sold all over the nation. But they didn't pick up Snap's book, which is what happened recently, you know, what it's all about. Uh, Cy Hirsch, you know, who broke My Lai, he was in Vietnam, he got onto the story, he refused to drop it, he, he resisted intimidation, and he, he cracked My Lai and a series of articles, and he pounded away until he got prosecution on it. He kept after it until he, he did My Lai. And he wrote a book, and he's a talented writer, and he wrote a book, uh, uh, about how I cracked me like the inside story of what all happened trying to get this story out and it didn't get a mass market sale if you can believe that but it didn't and so what they'll tell you in New York is that they look for books that have a certain little touch or flair that they can do one book for a million dollars instead of ten for a hundred thousand dollars 
and so a lot of very good books don't get, get paperback sales. John, John, you mentioned the movie that um, might be made of your book. What's happening with that project? Well, I'm, I'm learning as I go along about books and about movies. I've got uh, uh, three parties, uh, two in New York and one in California, and one of the ones in New York has California Connections that are heavyweights, that are people that are capable of doing big movies of books like this, who are talking to me very seriously. I've had four written offers, uh, proposals, and I rejected them because there was a flaw in each one that made them unacceptable. But uh, pull for me, a little <laughs> bit of luck, and, and, uh, and I, we might get a, a really exciting movie about this, this book, In Search of Enemies. In closing, I wonder if you could tell your thoughts on how you feel about your having taken a moral stand against the CIA, criticized its crimes, its dirty tricks, whereas William Colby, the former director who was in charge of the Phoenix program that was literally a program of genocide, has continued to defend the CIA and travels around the country in defense of it and has gotten a lot of media play and is taken as one of the pillars of the establishment, whereas you're looked up on a bit as an outsider. How do you feel about this? Plus the fact that Colby is now retired in rather opulent splendor in his little sailboat and here you're struggling to make ends meet. Well, I, I don't have any great sense of bitterness I think it's an unfortunate statement about our society and the way things are that someone can, like Colby can have blood up to his armpits. Uh, the deaths and programs that he personally ordered and managed total at least 40,000 people dead. And that's just two programs. There were a lot of others. Uh, and he retires with great dignity, as you say, and honor. Uh, but I don't feel the slightest bit of lack of dignity or dishonor in my own position. Absolutely not. I have not been, uh, I have not had a single experience in which uh, people made me feel uh, less worthwhile or less worthwhile than Colby. He did uh, run out his full career and get his pension. He did uh, have his uh, legal degree, and because of connections that he had through the CIA, he's uh, established a practice and, and comfortable business was thrown his way. I would say the only thing uh, uh, that, aside from the moral issue of a person who has committed gross crimes against humanity, uh, not nearly the scale and scope of Holocaust, but the same principle, uh, is, is admired and leads a dignified life. Uh, aside from that, just practically the way he lives, the only thing that I regret is the trend in the nation to give people like, by universities primarily, to give people like Colby and former President Ford and uh, Admiral Turner and Kissinger uh, abundant uh, fully funded opportunities to lecture uh, and they stand up and lie and tell it like it was not and uh, people like myself who are willing to, to go before the same groups of people and tell it like it is and tell the truth and tell what happened and uh, I lectured at UC San Diego uh, six weeks after President Ford had been there ex-President Ford and uh, he had received he had lectured for one hour much of what he'd said was patent lies, not true statements. He answered three questions and left in a limousine and got $10,000. Mm. I stayed for about five hours talking to those uh, people and uh, did my level best to tell the truth and provide accurate insights, and uh, I got $400. And, uh, th and this is unfortunate. It's, uh, it's a, a further statement of the trend of the times the establishment is back in. People like Colby uh, are getting a wider audience. Turner is invited to lecture and uh, permitted to stand up and deliver his lies, and he's funded for it. Yes, I, I regret that. Uh, I, have, I have to pay my rent, and I'm succeeding in paying my rent, but uh, I would be a little bit happier with the situation if I had more opportunities to lecture even than I do 
and uh, more economic freedom to, to get about more and lecture more to people that are interested. But that's a small detail, and it certainly was not a surprise when I, let's face it, when you're sitting inside the CIA at the level of a colonel, a younger man, you're not a director, you haven't had uh, national, international prominence, and you quit the CIA and you, you attack them, you write a book exposing them, uh, you're, you don't expect to have the CIA and the establishment uh, pat you on the back and buy you a limousine and, and set you up for life. You know that you're going to be a little bit of an outsider at best. In fact, you worry about things much more profound than that. Are you going to survive? Are you going to be hurt? Are your children going to be hurt? These are the things that you think about and decide probably not. You will survive and, and they won't bother your family. But certainly, you're not going to be offered a $100,000 a year job with Exxon or Gulf Oil or some such. Well, John, we really thank you for dropping by again. These are really exciting programs. And from the response, the people and the various audiences we've had also consider it that way. So keep it up. I'm really proud to have been part of this show. It's a very, very worthwhile show. Well, come back again. All right. Thanks, John. Good, Good night. night.